if the uh, administrator would call the roll. Anderson is absent tonight. Chair Bagelman. Here. Vice Chair Dane. Here. Uh, Frankie. Here. User. Here. Olson. Here. Payne. Here. Solheim. Here. Wilson. Here. Okay, you folks all have an agenda. Are there any additions, corrections? And if not, do I hear a motion? Move to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. Those in favor, indicate yes. 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 Those yes. no. The agenda is approved as presented. Uh, minutes of the November 6, 2014 meeting are again in front of you. Any additions or corrections? I, I've got one I have a question about. On page three, the uh, under old business, the paragraph beginning Mrs. Ms. Olson and the, let's see, one, two, three, four, fifth line. And there may be a question in if the council resolution in place. Help me with what was intended. Uh, I believe. Uh, I decided not to try to make it up, so. Well, I think the, um, I think the goal of that sentence was to, was to confirm um, there is a resol well, there was a question if a resolution is in place that may require minimum planting standards on the west side of the property. I think that was kind of the sentiment. I know um, council person Waldstein was here and I think she had indicated she was aware of that, um, that there may have been a resolution to that effect that stated that. So I don't know if that was the accurate uh, statement. So I, I believe if we remove the word in um, so that it reads, Council Person Waldstein confirmed there is a resolution approved for $100,000 and money needs to be used for landscaping. And there may be a question if the council resolution in place would require minimum planting standards on the west side of the property. But we don't know the answer to that. Is okay. That correct? At that point in time, correct. Okay. Now that, that helps, but the, the wording, I don't want to edit somebody else's wording. How about any other additions, corrections? One thing I noticed was we had a fair amount of discussion and I don't find it in the minutes regarding the change of the U1 to R. And we discussed quite a bit regarding the discomfort of several of us having R zoning into the middle of the river or into the water anyhow, not necessarily the middle. But that t uh, topic appears to not show up in the minutes. Specifically about the middle of the river or the other whole U1 discussion, that's in there. The U1 discussion overall is, but the part regarding um, why have property resident, our zoning into the river. I never is, understood that conversation to be part of the question on the table, though. I thought it was really? sort of, I mean, it wasn't on the discussion of can we even address the fact that it goes into the river? That was never, I never understood it to be, you know, we have some actual agenda item that deals with the fact that it goes into the river. Well, the staff, is, is, it states in that third sentence, first paragraph, staff is seeking to rezone single family residential properties from U1 to appropriate R district designations, which would be adjacent. So, I mean, I, that's saying that, you know, they want to take that area and put it into R, which would be, you want to be in the, in the river. That's and, what the map showed. Right, and I know, I believe, Mr. Huser, I think you had stated, too, that uh, you had a question about that, right, as far as, um, I think one of your statements may have been captured was generally that um, you believe it's important to maybe leave it in there leave the U1 and the R1 split so that the U1 portion may reflect, you know, in the river area that it's a hazard area. It, was that correct? Yeah, I mean, basically, I think the U1 should follow the uh, floodplain line. Okay. Uh, this basically, what I'm saying is because how many people know to go out and look at the, you know, to the federal flood map to see exactly where it falls onto their property, and if it 
then go just to one place and see the U1 designation. If it followed the floodplain, then I think it would be much more informal and for much better information for the the consumer that's either buying a property or looking to improve upon the property or something. That's where I was coming from. Okay. So, so the one sentence that I have for you is on page two. Um, it would be the second paragraph, you know, that kind of tried to capture that in that one sentence um, about supporting the U1 designation um, as it may be useful for property owners and potential buyers of properties to ascertain the highest and best usage of properties. I was trying to encapsulate the, the gist of the conversation. If, if I need to expand that a little further, I certainly can, and I have no problem doing that. If, would that be okay with you? Yeah, I think... To re-listen yeah. to that and try to capture that a little better? I know there was discussion several years ago, and we talked about having that U1 to follow the um, uh, the the flood map, you know, because there's some some areas that had U1 um, where it was sitting up on a cliff, or I shouldn't say a bluff, maybe to uh, state it better, that you know they could build on that bluff because it was out of the floodplain, and we looked at changing that U1 designation on some of those properties at that time and I guess that's where I would come from that way people can easily look at a zoning map and see where that line is and I don't know that it follows the true floodplain at this point in time because I think they'd somebody just kind of draw drew a line through there you know so that's where I would look at it instead of throwing that residential out into the middle of the river in some cases I'm just one person Thank you for that clarification. I feel more confident now. I, I can revise that. And do you have any specific language, Mr. Huser, you wanted maybe to include in that that, that would better capture what you had said? Or No, I, I mean, I think I'd just say that the, the UN should designate the, the floodplain, you know. Okay. Thank you. How do you want to handle that? <clears throat> you want to just bring it back at the next meeting and uh, approve it with the... Well, I, I will amend it and include it in your next package. You'll have the chance to review it at that <coughs> time uh, based on tonight's conversation, okay. unless there's anything else. But I'm making a list. You know, the, the, one, the one question I had, you know, when you were talking about staff, it was a recommendation by staff and um, um, the singular zoning, but wouldn't it be easier if that U1, you know, explain to them that that's area that is in the floodplain and I don't know. I mean, I just I was trying to understand where staff was coming from and wanting to, you know, put the whole lot as designated as an R or residential, and then and then they they'd have somebody to have to go look at the floodplain and and our flood maps and and and, and in some cases it's going to be a little more confusing today because of all the um, lomas um, uh, that are going to be out there, and if they don't know how to. Um, you know, click on that Loma to see, you know, because some, some have got the new designations and it's just not a general map, so it is a little more confusing for the average person to, to look at that, I think, but that's just my thought, you know. So if the staff has a better, I mean, or explanation why they think it's important, I mean, I'm not trying to be a, sure. um, a, a problem here, but I just, I am trying to understand why, you know, so. Well, it's important, though, that our, our written record be as to the points that were made at the meeting. And uh, Dave, would, would you mind at some point getting together with Ben just to go over sure. that piece? And then we'll bring it back next meeting. How about other uh, additions, corrections? Uh, what we'll do is we'll suspend the approval of the, uh, the minutes for this meeting, bring it up on next meeting. And uh, we'll move on from there. I just got one question. Does that answer your yes. question? Yes. Okay. Okay. That, that's helpful. Okay. Communications, Ben. Um, <clears throat> Board of Adjustment agenda and actually the minutes from the November 10 meeting um, from the Board of Adjustment. You have that in front of you. Um, there was a case that was heard. Any questions on that? The one with the zero setback? Correct. Yep. It was for Fourth Avenue Northwest, I believe it was. And um, the church wanted to put like a, an entryway out to the right of way limits. Mm -hmm. um, and they were granted um, the approval to do that. 
and there was much talk and consideration about traffic going across the public sidewalk, the cross slope, and exiting back in kind of a horseshoe driveway fashion about that. So the minutes should reflect that. Southwest. Or Southwest, excuse me, correct. Fourth Avenue Southwest. But that's something that we really have no input into anyway, right? Um, unless you want to it was comment dealt on with it. by the Board of Adjustment. Right, and, and that's their role. And, and, if, <laughs> and part of that Board of Adjustment uh, correspondence sent your way, too, is to say um, this, these are some of the cases that are being heard. So, you know, part of your role and responsibility, too, is to oversee the ordinance, um, the planning and development of the community. So if you, you know, see the opportunity maybe to improve a situation so a Board of Adjustment case may not have to come forward in a similar circumstance in the future, that, I mean, that, that's why we correspond. So. Hopefully that helps illustrate a little bit about that's why I try to push these forward whenever I can and so you have a chance to see them too and if need be state what uh, maybe something we could work on. I, just for my benefit, I, I don't really understand the history of that, you know, in terms of was it, uh, was it an issue that ever was before planning and zoning or it isn't anything within our jurisdiction and because it's a variance to an existing ordinance it went directly to the Board of Adjustments exactly right mm -hmm. they're asking of relief uh, due to a hardship or extreme circumstances there is a bit of I only heard it as a hardship I never <laughs> heard it as an extreme uh, circumstance before you could insert those words for the for hardship I expanded upon that yeah. oh, good. I hadn't heard that one before from any staff before there is a bit of a dotted line relationship <laughs> between the board of adjustment and this commission. Uh, you'll recall a couple of months ago we had the uh, Snyder milling request come in and it was as a result of a hearing they had had at the board of adjustment knowing that it could be a recurring circumstance and if we would take care of the zoning uh, that would take care of having it uh, surface again when the next uh, facility was going to be moved. So it, uh, the, the two, the board and the commission, while we don't work together, we're aware of each other. Anything else for the minutes? We took care, oh, that's correspondence, never mind. Anything else, Ben, come through? I have. Okay. Okay, next item of regular business, we're gonna set a public hearing for special provision reuse for roof-mounted solar energy panel array at 76th Avenue Northwest. And uh, our purpose tonight is to take a look at uh, what they have in mind. And I think we have some gentlemen here who are representing the, uh, the question. Would you like to come up? If you want to, if you want to oh. talk up here, they can hear you a little better. That works great. Thanks. So I'll we're, start. We're, we're usually fine. It's the folks at home. That there you go. So I'm Paul Green. I'm the industrial services manager at Nestle, and Russ Birch is with me. He's with Paulson Electric, and they are acting as the general contractor for this project. So this project actually started um, a couple months ago, and it's. Um, putting up 132 solar array panels on top of the roof of our main trucking dock. And uh, obviously in the, uh, in the effort of uh, generating some electricity for, for plant use from that. The, uh, the project uh, has uh, been completed for the most part. The solar panels are in place. The, we still have cabling to do and so forth. Um, but we wanted to uh, come and, and get uh, a final blessing with the special provisional use for having those panels there. They can slightly be seen by the public um, in their location. And, uh, and that's why we're here. Where can you see them from? If you are um, of the 132 panels, if you're on the sidewalk right next to our building or if you're across the street, 
um, you can see probably a half a dozen of them that are closest to the edge. So then, what is it about this that makes it a requirement for a special provisional use? A while back, um, this is still, thank you for coming mm -hmm. and describing your project, and this is still a relatively, um, uh, you don't see a lot of this, of people taking advantage of the alternative energy options um, and the solar array with the panels at a 30 degree angle. Um, our code views that as something, and P&Z Commission, some of you may have been on that commission at the time, we, we picked up that alternative energy ordinance concept and really vetted out uh, how are we going to treat solar panels? Um, what if they're architecturally on, on a rooftop and they're hugging the roof versus a, an array that's at a 30 degree angle versus on the ground in a, in a commercial setting or in a residential setting? Um, and where we concluded was the way our code reads today is that generally speaking, if it's going to be mounted on a rooftop and angled um, and it's going to be set up for a special provisional use in a public hearing so that the public's aware in case they may have questions or concern. Um, once these are up, they could produce potential glare uh, if the conditions are just so. Um, and I know this particular location may not provide that instance, um, but if something were to, you know, come up, now is kind of the time and the place to really ask these kind of questions about this because if once these are approved, it's thought of these are going to be there for quite some time. Um, so our code essentially reads in such a manner that a special provisional use is a requirement if they're mounted on the roof and angled um, by other means than hugging the roof. So, so they're not an architectural feature at that point. So that's generally how the code views that. And that's why we're here today is to set a public hearing to gather uh, questions or concerns you may have before we push it to a public hearing so that the public uh, may, may be aware of this. And we will send out letters to about 200, a 200-foot 200 radius um, just in case somebody may have a question or they're curious about it. And that's the time and the place to have a public hearing. And then it'll go to council for one formal reading uh, before it's finally decided. And did I hear it? It's already built? Yes. That, that's what I just Yes. So as part of the process, like I uh, mentioned early on when I started my quick presentation here, is it's still a relatively <coughs> new concept. I'm not sure the contractor nor the building inspection staff may have been aware that this was in the code. And so typically on a building inspection process for electrical work, that's how this was viewed. We really aren't copied in on it as far as the zoning review. However, this is something that's under the purview of the zoning code. So we're kind of on the tail end of the project. Most of it's up. They have cabling to do, I understand. Um, I'm not sure what else. But I know it's basically almost done, and so I explained, well, we should go forward because that's what our code reads, um, and I think it's only proper to see our code through. But is there something written in the code then that needs to be corrected so that something isn't built before it's approved? Well, it's really, I think, there, it, there is better communication yeah. within, yeah. The, uh, within the staff and, right. and the building inspector. Uh, yep. And, and that's what you're hearing, is that generally we're still working on this. This is a newer concept. Most people, this is only the second one I'm aware of in our community that has been put up on a setting other than Waverly Light and Power. I mean, we have one residential dwelling that had put this up a while back, but they were hugging the roof. It was an architectural feature, so it didn't need to come forward. We don't see a lot of this. So this is probably the only second instance other than Waverly Light and Power that I'm aware of. So that's a good question. So It just it, seems to me that... We need to have the code written in such a way that we manage to it. We are managing than, it. You know, do it and then come for approval and a public hearing. I mean, what's a public hearing going to do now after it's built? Other than you get down. Yeah, I mean, it could happen. I mean, and I, I, I mean, I love the concept. I, I, mm -hmm. I, you know, certainly have no issue with that. But I, I'm looking at this procedurally, that doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but I think it's also a new concept. I mean, I don't think there's a whole lot of solar panels in the state of Iowa to begin with, and I don't think that a lot of, probably a lot of towns don't have an, a code that's even going to, where they're probably encompassing the same problem. 
I and you know I I think you're probably right. Yeah. Okay, but I'm not willing to say. No, I get what you're that, saying. That's an okay thing. Just it's no. new, so whatever goes. No, it I'm seems just, to me it's we a gray need area to have that, the yeah. have the code written in a way that it reflects how we're going to manage to it. It's not so much the code though. I think it's just the communication. Well, and that's just it, and that's, and, and frankly, that's why these are coming forward as a special provisional use, you know, at any point in the project so that the public is aware that if you're going to do some kind of a solar panel on your rooftop, whether commercial or, in, or residential, check with the zoning office first. Um, we do have some basic minimum guidelines. Essentially, if it's architectural, meaning if it's hugging the roof, you don't really need to come forth to the board or the planning commission, uh, but if you're going to position them and they're um, kind of supported by brackets or other means you're going to you know adjust the angle of them to capture the sun and and potentially it could produce a glare um so i mean that's why we have this procedure in place still, the project's done it's they still have it's not I mean, it's essentially the, yeah. everything's basically in place they're still waiting to fire them up for like a better term well right but <laughs> or I open mean, them up for business the structure is there what really i mean they're not going to tear down the structure to change it to well, you know, sure. if it, sure it, it, we could, it could happen, you know, <laughs> we've gone through a couple, or we've had this situation where it didn't pass and yeah. we had to go back. I mean, it's, it, it does have to, it has to go through these hoops, but I mean, I mean, your point is, is very good, but we got to go through these hoops to make it right, you know, and so, I mean, that's, now if there's some things that have to be changed and that's something we may have to ask Ben to bring back to us on a code mm -hmm. or something, but we do have to go through the public hearing, I mean, just to make it correct. You know? Hey Ben, I just pulled it up and it says a request of a waiver for the, a request of a waiver for the public notification requirement may be submitted to the city administrator. Mm -hmm. So could they waive the process? And it does um, then note under B, roof mounted solar energy system. Well, they could. Uh, and, and typically, I mean, I guess they could if they so choose to do that. I don't know if they've been notified of that. That's in no. the code, though. I mean, no, they, they could at least waive the process, mm -hmm. especially in this case where we're, what, 90% through the project or something like that. At least it's an option that should be brought forward. Because so, otherwise we're, I don't know how close you are to being done with it, but at least they should be aware of it. Yeah, and, and staff's been working with the contractor kind of on this, you know, kind of on the tail end of it, so. Probably delay it just the same as what this would go through, even if they did the waiver, because we'd have to, we have to prove the waiver. I don't know. Because I'm guessing it comes under the same provi special provisional use, does it? Well, I mean, the, the way the code reads, I mean, that, that might be taking some liberty. I mean, we can both read the same language and perhaps pull different things out of it. Uh, when it says waiver, I mean, do, do we want to entertain that a little bit? I mean, so that's on the table, unless there's other well, thoughts I, on I th that. I think we've said it, and <clears throat> so it needs to be considered. The, the other thing I'm wondering is, if we have a public hearing, are there residences within 250 feet of the site? Yes. I, I would think so, yes. because I know they'd be west yes. of uh, mm -hmm. the nesting plant. I've got a yeah. layout here. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Kind of shows you the angle, where the array is, and what's. Well, the advantage of doing a public hearing, obviously, is that we are able to bring the neighbor, neighbors in and uh, give them a chance to ask questions about it and learn about it, and uh, perhaps uh, kind of pull some of this back together again. But I think we know what we have right now. We need to figure out how to how to get the greater good out of it. So, what are your thoughts? I'll put it on the table so we can get it discussed and either pass it or not pass it. So I move that the Planning and Zoning Commission set a public hearing for the January 8th, 2015 commission meeting to hear its roof mount of solar panel request. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you. Okay, any further discussion? I would like the uh, <clears throat> record to show that along with Kathy, I'm a little... I'm very disappointed that we've reached this point and it's already 90% done. And I think part of the problem is that, it, 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 from my perspective, is that the inspection services are not in-house part of the city of Waverly. And I simply want it on the table that, and part of the record that I really think the city needs to 
uh, bring those services in because using obviously contracting with the county <laughs> things are slipping through the cracks there's a lot of I hear more than once other other question of poll and subjective interpretations that if it was brought inside uh, the city would have better control so I simply like that part of the record other comments Hearing none, are you ready to vote? Mm -hmm. Okay, those in favor of holding the public hearing at the January meeting of the commission indicate yes. 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 Those opposed, no. Motion is carried. We will see you in January. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, ben, can we have this on the agenda to talk about how that waiver would be handled? In the future, whether it be something like a special provisional use or what, what, what mm -hmm. kind of a, yeah, you know, so we get it settled right away, you know, so going forward we don't have this happen again. And and I, I do commend your thought process, Rich, because I agree with it 100%. Uh, because uh, well, as you and I have talked before, I ran into personally the same situation with the building officials. So. Okay. I'll put Thank that you. on the agenda for next month. Good discussion done. about that. Thanks. Okay, next item of business is to set a public hearing for rezoning a property at 350 First Avenue Northwest from R4, multiple family residential transitional to C3 Central Business Commercial District. And I think we have a representative here. Ben, you want to do a quick overview first. I, should have done this the last time, but a quick overview of this and then we'll move. Sure. So the property in question here is the uh, old junior high building. We're all familiar with that building and structure. Um, the property of that is currently zoned as an R4 multifamily transitional district. Um, and that allows, if you look in the code, for some um, office, office by appointment kind of applications, no retail, and, um, very limited service because of that office by appointment kind of notion uh, of what you want to accomplish with the R4 because of the close proximity to residential. And um, so what we have here is a zoning request uh, that's coming forward um, that would do two things. Number one, it would conform the existing, um, the gym 24 um, that is currently run out of the gymnasium portion of that building and also to entertain potential more applications. And I know um, uh, HTS Architects is here tonight um, to help with generally describing what the client may be wishing to do uh, with this rezoning request. So with that, uh, I'll step back and allow him to step forward. Hello, I'm Andrew Bell with HTS Architects, and um, we're working with uh, Mike Denai, um, who is uh, Mike or, uh, Denai Holdings Incorporated that owns the building. Um, the hope with this building is um, to um, allow the existing building um, to remain um, intact rather than um, to potentially have any other consideration of removing it um, and to bring into the building new um, functionality by allowing first floor to be uh, reused for various um, small commercial operations like uh, dance studios. Um, he's um, talking to martial arts, uh, martial arts studios. So ge a general use of offices, um, different types of studios, um, a potential small time um, shop um, for the first floor would be those types of uses. Um, he's just trying to develop it with as, as a developer wants as many functions possible um, to allow different tenants use of that space. Um, the residential function that he's discussing at the moment um, is not true residential, but uh, more of a boarding house type of facility on the second floor um, where they hope to do a wrestling camp. Um, and so it would be somewhat of a dorm type functionality on the second floor, um, utilizing some of the gym facilities within uh, the gym 24 area as well as the um, old basement, um, which many of you may remember. Um, the gym in the lower level of the junior high. Um, so he just, it's uh, appropriate um, to transition the property from R4 to C uh, C3 simply for the uh, gym 24 being there already. Um, and uh, from my understanding, talking with Ben, 
um, that was somewhat of a um, agreement um, before, and Ben can speak to the details of that, but um, there have been plans once the building was changed hands to be reevaluated, um, and we we're just kind of following through with that understanding and to give more functionality to that existing building. Thank you. So in regards and follow-up to that, yeah, the Gym 24 has been there for a while. Um, the thought was when the school still owned it, um, it was being actively marketed. And I know they entered into a, a contract with the option to purchase. Um, when the Gym 24 moved in and staff made it clear that if and when it did actually sell, uh, that that Gym 24 would have to be brought into conformance. So it took that long to get to this point where somebody actually purchased the property outright. And so here we are today trying to conform a use out of a gymnasium that was already there and didn't require any structural alterations. Uh, the way, or they're very minimal to what I understand to be able to utilize the open gymnasium area. So that, that's kind of how we came to be today. Ben, what, what is it that they can do in a C3 that they can't do in an R4 transitional? I mean, for example, when I look through some of the uses in the three, C3, uh, you've got just about anything from an automobile uh, repair shop to a liquor store to plumbing and heating, electrical contractor shops. All of those could go in there if we agree that that should be R3. What What is it that, I mean, th this lot butts up on the one side, at least the west, uh, right up against the residential area. Mm -hmm. So how, how, how is, is your client, I guess, better served with the C3 designation given the kind of uses they're talking about as opposed to keeping it R4? Can they not do what they're doing now in an R4? There are several special provisional uses that may allow some of the flexibility but don't necessarily, I, I'm not fully aware of all of the uh, ins and outs of Waverly Zoning Code, but um, I, I think that many of the uses that could potentially inhabit that first floor would be special provisional, and then any time a new um, tenant would like to come in, you would have to have another special provisional hearing to allow any new um, per tenant to come into the first floor. Um, and so we're trying to avoid um, uh, it was suggested to me to seek the C C3 to conform the property, and I think that it's appropriate because then you wouldn't have to seek special approval every time you have something that would be a, um, coming into there, but appropriate for that type of use. There is an adjacent property that is C3, if I recall. Yes. The, uh, the, there's a blank the parking lot. In, to the, the south. Little, yeah. Right. There, there's an open lot that goes with this property, uh, and then there's the Walgreens property. Yeah. That fronts on to bring. It is contiguous. Yes. Well, the Separated by right of way. Kind of right across the street, yes. partially. Yes. Separated by right of way, correct? Yeah. And then there's some of the flood buyouts that's next to it, too, isn't it? I'd have to look at the map. Uh, off of the northwest corner, is that flood by out there property? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Somewhere in there. Right. To immediately to the north. Um, if you looked at the uh, future land use plan, um, some of those properties that were city buyout, they're colored a green shade. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of tell, right? It's the one to the north, one of the middle lots there. Then correct, directly to the west and. On the northeast corner of the block to the west, those two residential lots are city buyout lots, and then to the northwest of those, or in the north of those as well, yes. I clearly don't understand process on all of this, but let's suppose that, you know, 10 years from now, uh, Mr. Deny or whoever owns this decides to sell it. And the new owner wishes to make it into condos, okay? Then how does the process work? Would that have to be then changed back to something residential or does that happen before the new person purchases it or how does that work? 
So how, how that would work is right. I mean, the property is bought and sold without you or I knowing that. The, what comes into play here is when they apply for their building permit and they clarify their use. And then we look at that use and we, and we look at our menu of options within the district to say, is that permitted or not permitted? And then in this case, they were applying for a use that is permitted. And we're focused kind of, I think, on the main levels and the upper levels of this structure too. Um, so it is expand a little bit when you mentioned condos specifically, um, they could do that in the R4 today, the way it's zoned today. If they wanted to rezone to a C3, which they're asking for tonight, if somebody wanted to do condos, they would have to either do a special provisional use to allow those on the main level tomorrow, or apply just to have them on the second level, but anywhere other than the main level. The main level should be reserved for retail service the C3 uses if a C3 is approved. Does that make sense? Without special permission. Just like downtown. So the upper stories would be residential. Yes, I mean, it would be very similar to Without downtown. a special provisional use, correct, in the C3. So, and, but, and by not having a special provisional use, that allows them to, instead of every time they have somebody that would like to come in there, they don't have to come through the special provisional use and right. delay, you know, Re retail and service are not generally permitted in the R4. I mean, the only thing you could do as a retail, and it's very specific in special provisional use in the R4, is artworks or craft works. That's all we list. Is what? Artworks and craft works. So artistry and artist type, which you, you and I can connect. like they're doing down in Des Moines right now. <laughs> I think the goal is to say we want limited expanded uses in the R4, we want to reserve that for the C3, you know, for obvious reasons, to say once you get the C3, it's, you know, it could be restaurants, it could be uh, coffee shops, it could be retail, uh, barbershop, whatever you can think if of. If we recommend this change, then what happens? You're, you're going to set a public hearing uh, to, you're trying to decide tonight, do you have all the information you think you need to set a public hearing for the next month, and next month between now and next month, if, if we vote affirmatively, we will send out mailings to 250 feet, kind of like with the solar array, just to give public notice, give them a chance, put it in the newspaper, make everybody kind of aware, hey, there's something going on with this property. You're more than welcome to attend the meeting to hear about what's being thought of. These are the uses that are permitted. Are you okay with that as a, city, you know, as a neighbor? And that's the time and place to ask questions about parking, traffic circulation, uses out of the building, those types of questions. So. And then what? That's what we're trying to do tonight. And then what? After you're you're going to move one way or the other to recommend approval to the council or not recommend approval, and then the applicant at any time can continue to move forward and or pull it once it gets to council. Then it's three ordinance readings at council level. We're going to duplicate some of the uh, nearby residents, aren't we, on this one? Mm. If you run the 250? They're not quite, not quite? in the 250. No, not quite. They're further south. Okay. They're several blocks away. Yeah. I'm ever hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> they, they should be so lucky. Mr. They Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I move that the Planning and Zoning Commission set a public hearing for the January 8, 2015 commission meeting to hear the rezoning request from R4 to C3. I have a second. Any further discussion? I guess I was just curious, Ben, is the um, boarding house concept, is that permitted under R, R4? We really looked at that. Um, it's kind of, it, it's, not, it's not really a permanent living situation, so we, when we really looked at it, it didn't seem to meet the criteria for residential. It just, border, it was borderline, we're going to be here for a few days, kind of like a hotel type function. Yeah. So with that, it's more or less in a C2 commercial designation, so that's how we kind of viewed that. I just remember we addressed this on 4th, 4th Street mm -hmm. with uh, Harmony House or whatever it was, and I can't remember what we... There, what there was a bed and breakfast rooming house, Special right. provisional use, is that right. what we did? Mm -hmm. right. And I know with them I kind of hinted that we could try the special provisional, special provisional use route for just that exclusive use, but I think the desire, I, you know, in talking with Andrew and, and his client was they wanted to allow more expanded possibility rather than limiting to just that and then in case something would come forth and they could rent out some space so so Ben I may be misunderstood I thought you just said that the boarding house would be more like a C2 well let me take a step back the boarding house concept with the wrestling camp kind of designation when you're talking about 
it could be viewed one of two ways, okay? I think it could be argued the R4 boarding house, I mean, that could function as a special provisional use. So you could apply. So let me backtrack and say, yes, you could apply for that. But I know the applicant uh, and, and Andrew here and, and I talked and it sounds like they're interested in not only just that, but possible other type of uses. So with the C3 designation, they wouldn't necessarily need a special provisional use for a boarding house type function. So Does C3 work? would cover the C2, or it, it would include that part, okay. Right. And also to bring it in conformance with the gym 24 that's yes. already there. The, I'm trying to, it says, I've added all the numbers together. I haven't separated them out for a while. Um, it's about 12,000 square feet in a, excuse me, in a band around um, the uh, center open area. So. What percentage of the floor area is that? It's, it's odd because this, the basement is um, double high, so it represents a huge part that double high basement takes all, about half of the floor area, the first floor. The whole floor plate is 23,000 square feet. Um, and so the C shape around uh, the, the basement would be able to be these commercial functions. So where the classrooms and offices were? Yes. Just essentially repurposing um, those. There's just very little active um, modification of the building. Just bringing sprinklers in so that it can be, continue to be used and uh, change some fire doors is the extent of the the changes. We would like to see it used wholesale. The uh, one point for the commission I'd like to make is, you know, it, it seems we, we've been told that this is, you know, we buy it, now we're trying to figure out what to do with it. Uh, just as you don't start building solar arrays, yeah, make sure your zoning is in place before you buy a building. And it, a good businessman has to do that. And I think we need to keep that in mind as we uh, determine uh, so that we aren't held a um, little bit hijinks with the, uh, well, I own it and gosh, I can't do anything now. So we have to keep that in mind as we uh, discuss this next month. Any other There's comments? I was curious oh. and I'm not trying to get into a long discussion, but. You're saying that every time a party buys a property, they should get the zoning changed prior to the uh, consummation of the sale? From a business perspective, I think I better know if I can utilize this building or not. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of property that is purchased and later changes are made to it so I don't think and I just maybe we don't want to put that as part of the code do you <laughs> no <laughs> okay here we have motion before us that the planning and zoning commission set a public hearing for the January 8th meeting in 2015 any further discussion okay those in favor indicate yes yes yes, yes. those opposed no motion is carried we'll see you next month thank you very much mr. Bell yes. before you leave you heard the earlier comment by Mr. Dane. Would you care to comment about regarding the building officials uh, situation? But having them at the county level versus the city level? Yeah, I, I, mean, I know you've had dealings with them. I, I just, is there any comments that you'd like to make in regards to that? Um, I think that it, it would be helpful um, to at least be having them fully integrated and in understanding um, the uh, um, city ordinances for the zoning. I'm not sure if that um, may just be something that could be further encouraged um, in their current position as a county uh, supervisor. I'm not sure if it would really benefit and be cost effective to have a redundant service, a seemingly redundant service if you have personnel there already um, and you're commissioning them at the city level. It seems like it's a good arrangement, um, but perhaps encouraging city ordinance to be kind of more on the forefront of their uh, agenda as they begin to review things would be more effective. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And, and I will add that I, I do work with our building inspectors and I try to um, um, not really catch things at the forefront, but we do correspond, but there are cases where, you know, do you got an electrical permit here or this type of use, we're going to permit it 
for interior finish only, which is not on the purview of zoning, but you're right, then we get into the question about uses. So I, I would say the majority of the time we do hit the mark, there are a few circumstances where we may not. So I'd just like to add that for the record. Thank you. Thank you very much. Item number three. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Before we leave the R4 discussion, um, Ben, can you, within uses allowed under R4, mm -hmm. is a statement uh, within the code, all related commercial establishments, uh, and that further goes on commercial service establishments. Um, what is the interpretation of the code of what is all related, what are all related commercial establishments? Of for that, I kind of go to the, uh, the purpose of the R4, and that's at the forefront of the R4, and that helps me kind of further define the scope of what we're looking to do. Um, so we have to keep in mind it's meant to be a transitional zone between commercial and residential, um, all related commercial establishments, recreational and educational facilities, you know, those type of uses. So with that are associated with commercial service establishments. We actually define commercial service establishments, I believe, at the forefront of our zoning section under definitions. So if you look at business, um, I don't want to really get into it too much tonight, and I can happily follow up with you. Yeah, that'd be fine, then. I just, yep. I think, you know, with that being in there, I'm just thinking, eh, do we need an, uh, a change? But mm -hmm. So we could communicate that with with the whole commission perhaps? But I would direct everybody to the commercial establishment definition at the front of our code. It's defined and it's alphabetical, so look under C, commercial, and then you can kind of see for yourself kind of what is entailed with that. Great. Thank you. Okay. okay, item number three, ordinance amendment to include provisions for visual barriers between multifamily and non-residential uses from low density residential land uses. Staff is attempting to better define minimum standards and to better accomplish a visual barrier between residential and non-residential applications. Staff has noted a comprehensive land use plan goal of establishing better ordinance language and reference the existing parking section in the city code, which is silent on exactly what is required to accomplish an effectively screened, planted parking area. Staff is looking to expand the scope of providing screening to entire property lines and not just where parking areas of a non-residential or multifamily use are adjacent to a residential use. Staff has prepared an ordinance revision for the commission to review that includes another section in the code to accomplish screening adjoining land uses following discussion with committee members from the commission. Ron. All right. Well, we'll start off with the purpose. Um, as presented last month, what we've done is we looked at the purpose. Um, Susan, Rich, and I looked at that. And um, what we came up with was we wanted to further establish um, kind of our main goal. So we ended up with three of them of why and when it's going to be applicable, OK? So we're going to try to establish and enhance a pleasant visual character, which recognizes aesthetics and safety issues. We're going to promote compatibility between land uses by reducing the visual noise and lighting impacts of specific development on users of the site and abutting uses. And finally, to unify the developments and to enhance and define land uses. All that boils down to our goal here is to say if we have a residential, non-residential use or a higher density residen re residential parking area next to residential, the goal here is to say let's keep these in mind to further help us define and identify these situations. So that's what we've done from the last revision from last month. We've added that. Um, we also looked at the type of screening required. And when we really looked at this chain link discussion, what we decided is, well, why is it in there? Maybe we should just omit that, because in the end, we're identifying what we want anyhow. So instead of saying we want x, y, and z minus the chain link, Let's just not even mention the chain link because we're already asking for kind of what we want. Okay, so we struck that out of section three where it says type of screening required. And the other sections, the middle section was unchanged. I just got a couple more changes and I'll open it up to questions. And then we looked at 
uh, also in section three, um, where we talk about item C, planting strip and berming on page two. Um, we, we looked at uh, the initial item three and four there. Um, and then what we looked at is to say, we probably don't need the topsoil, four inches of topsoil as a requirement on the berm because typically you're supposed to guarantee the life of the plants anyhow. So why are we mentioning that? So we just struck that so that you can figure out a way um, other than making that a requirement. Um, and then we also looked at how to basically say drainage um, considerations for when you're piling up dirt, when it's you know within the uh, buffer area, we kind of looked at that. So number four there basically, um, I'm not sure we really did much with that because in the end we, we looked at it, but I didn't think it really needed to be changed because that's one of our goals. That's one of our main objectives. So I didn't really do much with that. And then when we talk about maintenance, also within that section, uh, we bumped up um, uh, the requirement from six months to nine months uh, where you're required, um, so you're, if we give you notice that your plants are dead and they're not providing a buffer or a visual screen, you have nine months instead of six months due to our uh, Midwest climate and Northeast Iowa location here to replace it with something. So you kind of have nine months of from here to there, and that was kind of decided amongst some conversation we had about the growing season and stuff. And then finally, two other additions that we did. Yeah. yeah maintaining or maintenance. Um, so you have a, a very dry summer, you know, when they're planted and everything, and so they die off in September. You really don't have nine months because, I mean, do you? Does that get you into? You'd have it until the following June. Yeah. So, okay. That is enough. I'm just trying to think through where to, I just, have some, I just don't have somebody come in and say, well, you didn't give me enough time, but I guess you would have. But initially it was six months to say if they die in June, yeah, you have till next June to do something about it, you know, but then it was like, like you had said. So we, we kind of considered that an extra three months was discussed and that's kind of what was decided and presented tonight. I'm just trying to think through there. I just don't have anybody come in and complain. Well, and that's generally what's going to gear this, I think, is going to be um, either staff noticing that or neighbors calling in saying, we don't have a visual barrier there anymore. Something's got to be done. And then we go through the process of contacting them, giving them a notice, a formal notice, and giving them this deadline that's in our code. So I, I think it's reasonable. Uh, it might be a little lengthy, but I think it's, it's warranted because of our climate and the possible situations that may come up. And frankly, within one year's time, they should have something established. So I was generally okay with that. So moving on, we, uh, so we looked at that and then we talked about landscape screening plan required, the section four there. The question was, when is it gonna be applicable? That was brought up at the last meeting. And then what we wanted to add is at the time of building permit submittal. So um, at the time of issuance, of its original permit. So before we can generally give you a, a building permit uh, occupancy, we wanna see something in place, or at least we would accept something to say, we will have something in place within two months time or three months or you know something that's somewhat saying we're going to do this rather than, you know, so we're trying to leave a little wiggle room, but the code basically says you need to have that in place. What's that mean in place? Does it mean in the ground or does it mean the plan is approved? So if we wanted to read, the plants have to be in the ground, I can amend that further, but I think as long as we say, the intent here is to say we're willing to work with you to a little bit, but we want it done. So that's, that's the way it's written. I see a big crowd here. Yes, welcome. And then finally for the exceptions, um, we looked at the additions and enlargements of existing parking lot surface area or structures. The thought here was, 20%, gee golly, you have a thousand square foot building, you're adding on 200 square feet with either a parking area or a structure. That's the, that used to be the trigger. What we did is we looked at that and we said, well, maybe 25% seems a little more reasonable. I know it was talked about, well, maybe it should be higher than the 25% that I'm proposing tonight. 
but I'm not sure where that mark is. Is it 30? Is it 40? Is it 50? I don't know. I thought 25 seemed reasonable. I can see uh, the example given was, I think, is a Walworth Dental Building. Um, where you, you're at the Willow Lawn Mall area, they did some renovation. Um, they didn't really um, increase coverage area. Um, it doesn't say amount of money spent on a property in, for improvements, then that's the trigger. It just says if you're increasing the area. So you're adding a, a dumpster enclosure area, um, you're adding you know, a drive under canopy area, you're just expanding the building permit a little bit. We're going to add all those up and compare it to this 25% or more, then we're going to make you screen that, okay? If you're adjacent or across the street from uh, a residential zoning district. So I walked through it pretty quick because I was just trying to highlight what we've done from last month to this month. I didn't really run through it again, but I think we all kind of have the gist of it. Is there any other thoughts on that or any questions about the discussion uh, Commissioner Dane and Frankie and I had? Maybe I'm just, um, maybe I'm overthinking it, but under maintenance of landscaping again, a potential plant or tree could become damaged. And so is that considered not healthy? I mean, should it say, should does not remain healthy or damaged shall be replaced? Because Somebody may, uh, a landscaper or something like that could damage a tree and, and um, you know where I'm getting at. And then so, somebody could say, well, it was healthy and it was just removed. So, so if you're, right, so if something is sit, standing in place and something is dying and it just, it's brown rather than green and it's still performing a function, is that warrant for making it be replaced? I, I would probably say yes. It's not healthy. <laughs> I mean, um, it could be wind, dead. it could be lightning, it could be uh, vandal, uh, vandalism. I mean, is that all considered unhealthy or should we just add the word verbiage or damaged and then it would be mm. contemplated? Well, it, I guess I would ask, so if we want to add damage, you know, what would be the extent of damage that it doesn't perform its function? I mean, visually, I mean, I try to put in here a requirement, I think I put in 75% of visual barrier yeah 75 percent non-transparency year-round if you choose vegetation i mean so we understand there's going to be little gaps here and there but our goal is 75 percent the majority of that <coughs> so so i think i guess what i'm just yeah could somebody get around it and not replace it not want to bear the expense to replace a tree because it was struck by lightning so, so my thought is they're kind of beholden to the plan that they would submit at the onset of approval too. to say if, if you're showing a tree here, and a tree, you know, you're showing five trees, one of those trees dies, you have four left, you could argue that you need to maintain five because that's what the city approved. So if it's damaged, like if a, if a branch falls off it, like half of it's gone, is that what you're thinking too? Uh, that's how I'm just thinking through this. Real world, this is what I'm going to be approached with. <laughs> I mean, I just don't want to gone. overthink it. If it's contemplated it within healthy as damage, then let's not change it. But, Or do we just add two words and say or damaged? I don't know. I, I, I don't really have a big problem with that. I was just trying to question um, what that may accomplish, but I can see your point now. There was a big walnut in our neighborhood hit by lightning several years ago. Large branch falls out of it. It is still alive and viable, but missing a nice part of its canopy. So, is that where you're coming from? Does it, should well, that be replaced? In general, it's 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 um, it's dead and it's damaged and and it has to be removed. I mean, that you could say that's unhealthy. I'm not saying like a limb falls off and now you have to replace it. I'm saying it's been wind took it completely down. More than fifty percent of the shrub or tree is gone mm -hmm. yeah, I, don't, I don't want to overthink it but I just things that that could come up well the, you know under D we have the you know end of the sentence is effective visual barrier is maintained so obviously if the tree comes down I think that's covered okay but you know you've seen some dead evergreens that continue to provide the blocking well, and that's yeah. where health 
continued health and maintenance of yeah. the. Yeah, so, so, so I would argue, I, I don't think a brown tree, even though it provides a visual screen, is the intent of the ordinance. Yeah, so I would I argue it's not healthy. Somebody may turn around and say, oh, okay, there's a little bit of growth still there, you know. So, I mean, I just. I know you would. So, That's so why I was going to defer to the Liberty. <laughs> so, so, so I think hence why we try to beef up our purpose of our, our code here, kind of what we're really trying to accomplish with this. And I think. You could argue a brown tree it may serve a screen, but it doesn't accomplish your purpose and your intent of your code. So I think we can hang our hat on that a little bit. I'm comfortable with that. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of all the nuances. I don't think we're going to have a big problem with this, uh, FYI, but I, I do know it is good. And I really appreciate the time and effort Commissioners Frankie and Dane have put into this and your input as well, because these are the type of questions we need to address up front rather than, you know, pushing it forward without some thought. So I really appreciate that. Are you ready I've learned to move a lot in this process. I, I guess I just had one other, you know, uh, we're a Trees Forever community. Um, is that what it is, Trees Forever? How do, we, how do we promote landscape standards with new developments? Is that through a, a code like this? Is that a separate code? So as I look at some development on 4th Street right now, how do we ensure that there's um, at least partial landscape standards put into place that and wouldn't rely <coughs> wouldn't rely on screening. And, and that's a good question, and that may segue into one of our um, uh, old business items that we want to revive. It's corridor planning. Um, when you mentioned Fourth Street, you mentioned a street. Um, you imagine going down that street and what you see, correct? Yeah. I mean, I mean, and there's a lot of benefits, and a lot of communities are going to that for 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 those reasons and purposes that you've stated. So I think we'll bring that up under old business, but I think um, the purpose of this again is just to address those specific instances where you have a non-residential uh, parking lot or a multifamily structure or a business use that has a dumpster in the back that is going to be proposed and there's our language now is weak at best and very open. And if you don't have property owners that agree, this helps tighten it up. So this is addressing just basically neighboring properties or across the right of way. Okay. And to incorporate further trees and, and shrubs, we kind of discussed that with a previous version of this, but it was kind of you know, whittled down to this, I think. So we started big with this you know, notion of, well, we want to prescribe, this is what we want to prescribe along the property limits. But then it got kind of watered down, I think, to this point, so it serves the core purpose of the visual screen. So we can bring that up, I think, for corridor planning at a later time, but I'll let the chair take it from there. But we're going to mention that in old business that's on the agenda. Does that help address your question? So that, that's how I envision this kind of unfolding a little bit. This is a probably one piece to a bigger goal, I think. So I think we're working towards that with this. And I do have one qu one more question. I'm sorry, but under um, four thirteen point four a fencing uh, shall be constructed of masonry. Now I apologize. I didn't go back through the code to see what the definition of masonry is. What is the masonry masonry uh, definition? Is poured concrete? Yes. Or is it strictly stone slash brickwork? Where are, you, where are you referring to? Under fences. Second page, A, fencing. It's under type of screening required, and then fencing is letter A, and then in that first sentence it mentions uh, masonry. Hmm. For the record, I wouldn't call poured concrete masonry. Masonry, that according to a quick internet search result, which is, I would say, pretty reliable. Masonry is the building of structures from individual units laid and bound together by mortar. So that's not poured Portland. Yeah. Cinder block. Cin <laughs> yeah, cinder block and brick. Limestone. Brick and, yeah. But not poured concrete, which I think is inappropriate. Well, surface. and I think, you know, if you would like, I could probably further clarify that. I mean, is your goal maybe not like a slab of poured concrete, but something with texture? Because we can make... I mean, if that's a concern, I mean, I, I'm just trying to read your mind a little bit. Is that why you're going with that a little bit? Well, I'm just thinking, you know, if I want to put up some fencing, I can, I can see putting up a three-foot berm and a, well, you know, put up a six-foot poured wall, a 
a three foot berm with some plants on it, I've got a pretty darn darn nice looking blockage. Yes, you do. And uh, <laughs> according to this, that might not work. If you're six feet tall, you're pouring it with concrete and your forms are up and you pour it and you leave town and you spend a lot of money on it and you go to the zoning office and you say see i got my masonry up yeah, you do well, you been having to take it down <laughs> <laughs> send the bill to the rich too then well and, and that's that's a good point like you know joking aside is that is that something we should further clarify maybe i think you should read vinyl wood or concrete You know, we could probably re remove masonry and maybe just leave brick. I don't know. With that. I, I I'll ask the architect. Because <laughs> you got stone, you got... I don't know. There's plenty of decent-looking concrete block. You know, there's... Well, um, just the stone. Well, keep, keep in mind, in theory, they need to provide a plan for, for the staff and me to review and approve, ultimately. So we're assuming they're going to do that. I mean, I can imagine bad-looking concrete, poured concrete. I can imagine lots of bad. <laughs> How about we go ahead and get this thing approved, and then if we run into Ben runs into yeah, problems, he can come back that's, at us so we can tweak it. We don't want court we beat this. We're, horse we're trying death. our best. I mean, this is we're trying our best here. And oh, I think I this agree. is a good. I, mean, I, I think this is a, for for what it's worth. Um, when I look at other communities, and I invite you to do the same. When you look at other communities, maybe uh, some of us that do a job that is uh, maybe related to the building industry may. May relate you may run into some that are a little more extensive than this um, I think this hopefully accomplishes something that may give the avenue and some option for some greenery in some of our developments that otherwise may not show up so for that I'm appreciative of the Planning Commission for hearing this and kind of moving forward with it and carrying it and for your ownership of it too because I really appreciate that in 99% of the cases where this applies will you have an opportunity to talk to the installer before they do it yes okay yep we expect a plan the same time building plans are submitted so okay. I, I along the lines of the concrete i'm sorry to i feel like we're beating a dead horse but um is it winning <laughs> <laughs> there is no opportunity here to use any sort of metal fencing or screening and i we, we took that out because of the chain link problem but that's not to say that there aren't kind of I can imagine doing fencing that wouldn't look bad with some sort of louver kind of condition. I mean, we do fencing on tops of, top of buildings to hide equipment all the time with little louvers. parapet walls. Yeah. I think what we're going to find is that it's going to be it's going to be somewhat restrictive, and you're going to get some pushback. Or is it almost better to say what we don't allow? Because I'm thinking of all the new stuff that comes out. There's like, well, would this cover composite, or would you consider that to be vinyl? Like, there's plastics now that are created. Is that technically vinyl, or is that a different product, which we would say you can't use now? There, there's two lines of thinking with when you're trying to create a code, is to say, and I've, I've encouraged this commission and, and others that I work with to say, you know, it's okay to say what you like, because, and then put it down to say that that's what you want more of. Like, if you see a development and you, you think, they did a good job with that because they've accomplished this, this, and this, and I think it should be repeated. It sounds similar to a corridor discussion that we had a while back that we're going to revive in a little bit uh, with the, that topic when it comes up. But the, the goal here, I think, because it's kind of reactionary to say, well, we don't like that, even though we allowed it the one time, and we're trying to get away from that. So I don't know. I think this is a little better, I think, to be a little more visionary to say this is our goals and purposes to say this is how we want to accomplish this. And so with the metal fencing question and, and you know, to your, to your comment uh, about, well, maybe we should put what we don't want, uh, you know, we could do that, but I'm afraid the list would keep going to the point where it would have been simpler to say this is what we like. So, so for instance, this lists four types of items or materials you can use to build. And the third line then says the design and materials used are subject to approval. So in that approval process, could you make an exception for another material that seems appropriate? Or does it only restrict us to those four things? Well, I mean, you, you could, as long as, here, here's how I view this. 
If you're making all attempts to incorporate masonry, brick, vinyl, or wood, and the conditions don't warrant that, then I think we, we'd be in the right to say, okay, due to extreme wet conditions, I mean, using wood, that's not going to work. Using vinyl, I don't know. Is there, I don't know. I mean, I mean, there, there's probably drawbacks to any number of these. Is it a high wind area? Maybe vinyl would be bad then, and maybe brick would be best. I'm with the artistic yeah. side of Kate that says, could be metal that's pretty cool. Kate, how would you uh, verbalize that? Yes. Well, I, I've been sitting here trying to ponder a way to do that, and my gut reaction is that in the end, it comes down to sort of a, a design evaluation, and there's nothing in here that really puts the authority to any one organization, one group to have design approval. We don't have a design approval process. Yeah. Um, we get into another sign list. <laughs> <laughs> no, I understand that. that there's issues with that. I, I get that. It's a great they, point, though. I mean, would you rather have cheap vinyl or ornate iron? Right. I mean, right. I mean, you could conceivably do an artistic kind of cut out screen thing in metal, and it would look great. I mean, there's a lot of lines on it. It really looks. <laughs> <laughs> well, then with all of the CNC kind of cutting available of sheet metal, I can Im quickly imagine good looking screen cut out of metal. <laughs> so it's a special provisional use then. <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> uh, no. From a designer that, point of view, I, that, that I, is would, a, I would feel limited. You know, all joking aside, I mean, that's a tool that, you know, staff, I mean, through an ordinance by design, you reserve the special provisional use for items that are open to, like, a, you, you want to open it up to members of the community that may have to, you know, weigh in on it rather than, and that, that's twofold. Either staff doesn't want to make that call because of numerous reasons and thinks it's more fair to allow the allowed to be in a public arena versus, well, these are the basic minimums. These, these ought to be met. These are pretty straightforward. It's a no-brainer. And that's what staff has no problem enforcing. But something like that where it can be somewhat open, you're right. Sometimes there are design um, committees uh, and communities. I, I don't think Waverly's quite there yet. I think we're entering that Can we just say, I'm sorry conversation. to something to the effect of other materials will require Approval by the approval by well, you've already got that in there, subject to the approval of the code enforcement officer. I mean, well, it doesn't say about other bright material. pink well, wall yeah. too, right in the middle of town. That I think that sentence though is suggesting that all of them need to be reviewed, regardless of material. Well, if you're going to put up right, if you're going to put up a vinyl fence, but you're only you know, I don't know if if it's if it's going to be put up in a way it's it's not going to accomplish for screening. You know, either, I don't know. It's, it's, so in other words, if you're going to propose something it doesn't meet muster, that kind of res the, the, the right is reserved by the staff enforcing the code to say whether it's good enough or not. So you're trying to give yourself a right, a little wiggle room to say, in these circumstances, we understand that. And I can see the merits of maybe including metal after this discussion. Um, Could you say a screening fence shall be constructed using materials such as? Masonry, brick, vinyl, or wood, and that is open some other materials. I think it's probably never going to, maybe this would just never come up. Well, let me ask, I just thought of something about, like, um, these areas where you got chain linked around tanks, you know, and, you know, I'm thinking of, like, the co-op one out there by across from Schneider's that's next to the residential, chain linked with a bar. Surrounding it, um, when you got things that you don't want to have anybody have access, like you know, gas or or anhydrous or anything like that, so you haven't allowed for chain link in that kind of situation if it happens to be close to a residential area. But that's not screening. They would still need some sort of screening. They could put that up, but they need the bushes. They need the. So they're going to have to go in, and so those situations. And, and, and that, that's a good point, and, and I think, and that's true, Rich, and I think w what our goal here is, is purely the visual screen. It may not be for security. Um, so we're not saying necessarily you couldn't have an eight foot, I mean, we're six foot minimum, you know, I mean, for a visual barrier. So if somebody wants to go eight foot in a commercial, the only requirements we have in Waverly for fencing are residential, no tall, and six feet. And that's kind of maximum. If you're in the front yard, it's three feet. But 
we don't mention uh, commercial or industrial kind of for that reason. We understand and that they may want to reserve the right to put up security fencing. So I, I think we're covered there the way this is written to accomplish that, uh, Dave. So I don't think I'm real concerned about that. No, I don't, you know, I go on to it's a good point. Rich's point, though, you know, like let's say it's anhydrous tanks and you don't want you want to be open so you don't have a mess situation where people are going in if this guy's screening in there they could hop the fence and be doing their deed and and because they'd be blocked out from anybody watch or you know the police going by so i don't know I mean, I'm, I mean, is that I'm reaching there probably but i just yeah. is that where the judgment call though comes well uh, yeah probably i don't know i'm just i'm just uh so Approval of the code enforcement official. Does the code, if somebody comes in with a metal, a really good looking metal fence, code enforcement says no metal allowed. Well, and that's, that brings up a good point. I mean, the way it's crafted today, um, the end product will be enforced by uh, my office. And let's say I move on or somebody else steps in, okay. What, what do they have to work with? They weren't part of this discussion. They weren't, you know, so how would they read it? And that's a good point. The hat is on somebody else now trying to enforce this. And they're looking at that going, huh, metal's not listed, but they mentioned everything else. It must have been for a reason. So we can't allow metal. So maybe, you know, based on that, maybe we should adjust that a little bit. I mean, I'm just thinking out loud. Well, then Board of Adjustment would have to make that decision. <laughs> well, I guess I'll, I'll leave it up it to, because I've heard it from more than one person about that. So maybe that is something, and I'm, you know, I'm seeing a couple head nods anyway that way. Maybe we should look at tweaking that a little bit, but maybe we could tweak it subject to that being tightened up. Is there anything else about this that you think? What if it just included some, or maybe there's language in here about Well, well and you, you have the right to move to include, to strike to include this okay. instead of that. So you can certainly do that. Sure. It's fair game tonight. Now again, and then yep. meet again and get more into or Nobody's going to be planting till. It doesn't sound May. like we're that far <laughs> apart. <laughs> just like or other approved. I mean, Heidi brings up a good point. We don't know five years from now what the next product's going to be. And it may not be described amongst those four. So you just need that approval. And maybe it's already there from the way it sounds, but maybe it can be spelled out again in that same sentence. If you use the words some metals, would that get at? Would fa fabricated metals or fabricated well I, I think cheating. that this I think that the potential if we're really just trying to avoid chain link fence mm -hmm. with plastic slats in it um, there we could certainly probably insert it back in it seems like you could take care of it with a different method either through the transparency piece well so like actual metal and, yeah, and maybe architectural metals. Or and and, and to make it simpler, I, I do like the notion of adding or similar or like materials. I mean, because I think that would encapsulate metal. It would encapsulate recycled shoes if somebody discovers they can make formed rubber fencing. I don't know. but Then it could also be the poured fence or the poured concrete, poured concrete. that's not in I'm going to patent that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's out now. Yeah. I think that's good just to add that word. Yeah, yep. I, I agree. would agree. And the one thing about it is I think we're getting away from the screening. I mean, it's, a lot of it is you're, you're doing fencing to have vis, um, you know, physical screening away from lights or noise and chain link or, fence, or metal fencing probably doesn't allow <coughs> for that. So. But it looks nice. So, um, so we're going to, my thought is to add or similar materials at the end of that first sentence under fencing. Okay. Then, then it goes in to talk about the purposes for the screening of it, and then if it accomplishes that, the, in, the end, in the end, the code enforcement officer is responsible for enforcing that to make sure it's upheld. I'm not quite there. Not quite there, only because I, I like where you were going, but I would then strike vinyl because that's what they run in the chain link. Okay. Right, that's, that's a good point. I'm okay with that because then we're still saying or similar materials, so. Are those grandfathered in, the ones that are around town? Yes. Yeah. Would you like them to be grandfathered in? Oh, I'm just asking. <laughs> I'm not going to get into the <laughs> But I mean, I can see some of them. 
<laughs> By the way, it's 22, 12, or 24, 14. And, and a, good, a good way to plan for the future is seeing what you like today and saying we'd like to repeat more of that. So. Okay, we've got our language. Rich, did you get what you wanted? I think Okay. Okay. Anything I'm, else? Sorry, just one I, quick question. No, On the height, residential can't be over six foot, but looking at the zoning or the code that industrial, there is no restriction. They could be 20 feet or they could be three feet, although we say would have to be six feet as well, a minimum now. Well, six feet minimum, well, that's what this says is, is for the buffer, at least six feet in height for the visual barrier. So if, in, in other words, if you're providing for a tree, I mean, the tree, you can't keep chopping it at six feet, you know, you got to let it grow up. But. but here the fence has to be six feet. That wouldn't include any other screening. This is purely the fence. Well, the fence, right? let's see, a minimum of six feet in height is how it reads. Right, just we, for the fencing, though, that would not include greenery or anything else. That's purely the fence would be six feet minimum. Well, well and greenery, If it were too, just we, a fence. Right. Right, but in the section is just fence, right? Correct. Yep. We talk about a fence, and then you could choose a, a green belt planting strip with, with with plants, and then you you finally have the option of berming dirt with plants to kind of accomplish the six foot tall from grade. So the only option including a fence is six feet minimum. Correct. Okay. Yep. Okay, did we ever get a motion on this? I don't think so. So do I hear a motion? How about the planning team here or the working team? I wouldn't mind if you, if you want to get together again one more time, if nobody's comfortable with I mean, if they want to look it over and reread it one more time, I'm fine with that. But if not, somebody else can make a motion, and I'm good with that too. But it sounds like maybe we do need it. Anybody have a sense that we do need to do a little to bit more research on something? Go ahead. Same question that Heidi kind of made me think about this. Do we want to put a maximum? Um, well, for, for fencing, I mean, I prob well, keep in mind this is screening residential from a non-residential use or a parking lot scenario. So, you know, because if you have a two-story industrial building, that's, you know, you're not going to screen it if you just put in a minimum anyhow. So I, I don't. I don't imagine anybody's going to go taller than six feet for a visual barrier, but I don't know. I just ideas I mean, for a, for just a fence because that is a structural component for a visual barrier. So maybe because I I've seen some that are eight. Well, there's certain kind of trees you could plant that could grow to 20, 30 feet. Well, I, I was saying more of the the fencing, you know. I don't think we're fencing any of this. I, did, I just didn't know. I mean, I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm just, just I think uh, practicality would just take care of that. I would hope so, but you know, there's sure some of the stuff that's come fence. through here <laughs> yeah. at times. You don't, I just don't think it's practical. And, but well, shall be six feet, no more than. I mean, all I know is if you go taller than six feet, you're going to have to beef up your foundations to your fencing posts and keep them from blowing over in the wind. But other than that, I don't see any other reason really to set them. I maximum, like at least but. six. Yeah, I mean, I'm fine with the, the minimum. I'm just thinking of the. Money. Is somebody going to put in, yeah, 10 foot, 20 foot? Oh, Look at the long interstates, you know, when you're going through uh, the residential areas in your metropolitan areas that they have there. Those are probably 20 to 30 feet. Except as you and I know, governmental agencies are unlimited pocketbooks. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> the businessman isn't, wall. so well, no, they won't do that. And i got to point out, too, that that's a scenario that probably wouldn't be applicable because you're talking about a non-residential use, screening from a residential use. I mean, a roadway and a residential. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm I don't think saying, that's applicable. You know, those are tall fences that are in there that you know, somebody could say, I want that. You know. I, I well, I think it, if and when something like that, I mean, to be frank, I think we're, um, I think we're, from what I've heard, I think we're there. I think we're entering one step above being ambiguous with language. We've tightened it up. Um, I think we can start with this and then need be revisit again. I, I like the comments. I think we're, I think we're there. That, that's my opinion. When you compare it to other communities, and I encourage you to do that too, just look, look on the internet, but I, I think we're there. 
I would move point. approval of the ordinance amendment to include provisions for visual barriers between multifamily and non-residential uses from low density residential land uses with the addition of or similar materials to whatever that section is. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Those in favor say yes. 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 Those opposed, no. It's passed unanimously and forwarded to City Council. Next item. The commission will review and approve the upcoming 2015 meeting schedule provided by staff. So July 4 is covered. Um, being that July 4, I believe, is a Saturday. Or is it a Sunday in 2015? Let me look at it. Yeah. That's the only one that's really a problem. That and New Year's when it's. Oh, yeah. yeah. But we don't have a New Year's problem this year. July 4th is Saturday. Oh, I, did you? Did anybody get that copy? I apologize. I just noticed in that. That's yeah, not on your. Oh, okay. I didn't get it. In that didn't work out very good. Okay, um, so it, it's second Thursday so, of each month. So, so the conflicts. Um, so, January 8th, obviously, we're going to meet. That's the. Um, that's the big change there from the holiday for 2015 that we have. Uh, so July, it'd be July 2 is the first Thursday, then July 4 is a Saturday. I don't think that's a big deal, but unless somebody thinks otherwise, um, every other day did not seem to be a conflict, so. And we took a look at it what, this afternoon and it looked clean. Yeah, I apologize, I oh. thought I had that in there. Well, there's no action required. But, um, and we, we can bring it forth to the next meeting, too. January 8, everybody be here. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll give you the updated. Then we can look at it that time, too. But um, Let's just go and approve it. You just want to approve it? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So, second. Appreciate it. And a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion is carried. Go on to old business, rental ordinance update from staff. Yep, um, city council, we had a presentation November 24. Um, everything seemed to go pretty good. Um, I thought that, um, and Tim is here tonight, um, feel free to chime in. Um, but to just summarize really quick, I know we're going with the housing quality standards, it sounds like. Um, we settled on the fees are gonna be $20 for a one-time initial registration fee plus $5 per unit. Um, in, uh, inspections are, I don't have it in front of me. They were upped from 75 to, I believe it's 125 for the initial. And keep in mind the inspection that it was thought of that that would be reserved for those times when there would be a bona fide complaint or something that obviously was awry or amiss with the property that it would be warranted. So it would not include staff being called to come out to look at a light socket that wasn't working right. I mean, we, we would say, no, that's up between you and landlord to work out. But if it's the wiring is bad in the house or plumbing is obviously cobbled up, I mean, that would be an inspection. And we would, you know, so it would be the 125 and I think it was 75 for the follow-up. So those were the two big changes was the monetary amounts. Um, other than that, everything else I think that I had presented the last month to you guys is similar. Or the same. Anything done about glazing or egress or parking in the front yards? Or? No, that was mentioned um, as far as as it was written and presented the last go around, and that was not changed. So what we would require is parking. You need a minimum off-street parking. What our code uh, calls out today for new construction for single family, duplex, multifamily, depending on bedroom size, that would dictate how many parking spaces you may need. 
And then in the converted single family home example, we did want uh, parking be reserved to no more than one third of the front yard area. So if you have a 66 foot wide lot in the old part of town, uh, 22 feet width is the maximum you could pave over for your parking or gravel. We don't have a paving requirement, but it needs to be graveled or anything other than grass, but no more than one third of your lot width. So that was the requirement for that. As far as glazing, um, we looked at the windows and bedrooms and how they were worded and working out. So what we settled is um, if a home was constructed and you're above grade with a bedroom, uh, you're not required to make changes if that uh, was approved the way it was, if you're above grade. If you're below grade, you do need an egress window uh, before you can call it a bedroom. And we would allow an occupant in that bedroom. So if you don't have an egress out of a bedroom, a non-compliant bedroom out of your basement, we would say you cannot count that towards a bedroom. Your occupancy would go down by that amount. So last time there also was discussion that we thought at some point in the past, we had discussed parking in the rear and that it had to be um, shielded. Did anyone look and see if that is in the codes? We were pretty certain that we had discussed that. Well, we presented it, and that was not um, that was not the version presented to council. As far as the screening in the rear yard, is that what you're asking? Um, that and the requirement to park back there, and we were thinking that it was already in code somewhere, that we had put it in there. If in the back. Isn't that, wasn't that discussed last month? Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure it was. It was one of the recent ones. Oh, that, that wanted to be included in the one of the items to be included? Well, because it affected the people, the backdoor neighbors. Okay. I'll, I'll revisit the minutes. I don't think it made it to the ver No, I didn't make it to the version presented to council, but I can make that known to the council that that was desired by the PNZ Commission. And we do have some sort of statement that says it can't be. It's going to be gravel or well Im improved surface is the term and that would include everything except just driving over sod or grass right okay. yeah it doesn't stop a resident or a rental person from parking on the grass right or do we have another ordinance well that I mean, the property owner may not design it that way right we we do not have something on the books today that prevents that in the parking area though the sidewalk and the street we had that right the only thing we changed uh, was a while back that's right is between sidewalk and the curb that grassy area that sometimes becomes muddy or rutted <laughs> that that was yep. yep so and if that's something to mention I'm I can push that forward too but I don't know how you if it's a rental person or if it's a homeowner that's doing it I don't know how you would well staff staff did present that a while back but it didn't um, got a little watered down I'll call it to, to the point where it, between sidewalk and curb was 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 said to be probably good enough at this time okay thank you next item you one zoning change for multiple properties update from staff so you have, um, with that link, when you click on it, basically what I have done is try to outline with the Sharpie, very technical there, um, just kind of try to outline further, you know, stemming from the comments that uh, Dave had, had said at the onset when we were looking at the minutes and kind of questioning about the U1 discussion we had. I try to just trace out the actual property limits with the Sharpie. Um, so when you look at those properties, some of them that go into the river that are along 20th Street, um, that'd be northwest there. When you look at those properties, they back onto the river and then their property lines actually extend out into like the uh, island areas into the river and it's a straight line, uh, part of the, um, you know, the surveying grid that the surveyors use. Uh, so a lot of people own river bottom, they may not know that. But um, so with that being said, these are generally the anticipated scope of the properties that staff is gonna look at. Um, so kind of going forward, staff's next step obviously is to con reach out to the property owners, talk to them about this, uh, have them sign something to say they're okay with this. Uh, but generally speaking, staff wanted to attempt to 
rezone the, a lot of these properties that are either partially a U1 and a residential designation to an all R designation to better clarify the actual intent of the property. And I do appreciate and understand the, the notion that, well, people should be made aware that there is a hazard on the property. But usually what happens is when you go to buy a property and you get a if you get a loan, they're going to red flag that right away, right off the bat for you. Anyhow, um, we do have current flood rate maps that are available that probably weren't as readily available back in the late 60s, early 70s, because kind of when this U1 uh, designation was established for a lot of these properties. But um, staff does want to reserve the U1 for a lot of city-owned properties that are along the river areas or along drainage areas and kind of just topography areas that the city owns that a U1 designation may work. We can still install basic city uh, park shelters, parking areas within the U1 areas, but there's going to be no grand plan for, you know, structures uh, in those areas. And if those do come up, I mean, we can push forth a rezoning application at that time to discuss the merits of whatever's being proposed. So, so there you have it. There's about four pages worth of uh, properties color-coded that I've outlined with a Sharpie marker that kind of show these are the properties I was looking at to kind of reclassify and rezone so that it, it conforms to all one designation other than U1 versus a blend of the two zonings. Questions, concerns? Is there any action required of us? Comments? Otherwise, we're moving forward, and I'd be happy to give you updates as we move along. I, I don't have a real good timeline of, of when this will come forward for rezonings, nor do I have a, a really good indicator of, you know, that I'm going to do all northwest, you know, in one month, and then all southwest the next month. And Because of what I'm going to do is reach out to property owners uh, through correspondence and phone calls and emails and see where we go from there. And um, But my thought is we, we would need the owner's consent before we do anything. Um, so they're fully aware of everything. So in case they need to clean up any issues with their property title deeds, um, but I, I I don't think this will negatively affect people. If anything, I think it'll help a lot of people and further clarify. Okay, I'm a residentially zoned property versus R1 and U1. What the heck? But why did we we just did the minutes and said we weren't going to pass the minutes because of this? So aren't we contradicting what we just earlier said? Well, well, I mean that's that's your right to say. I guess I am. I'm still, you know, I'm not going to be for changing that, and that's why we didn't approve the minutes from last meeting. You know, I still haven't heard a real good reason why the staff wants to go through this work. I think there's better things that they should be, you know, doing than to reestablishing the, you know, changing the zoning on all these residential lots. I mean, I, I, that's what I feel. And I, I don't know why you're um, pushing this. I wish. I, Well, I'll just reiterate that um, when a property is all entirely a U1 and you have residents on it and you're not essentially in the flood hazard area where the properties have been rezoned as not in a floodplain, I think it really begs the question of why are they still zoned a U1? And we had one property owner email me specifically, and I can share it with you. Um, she was upset and a little just confused. Why am I a U1? She's by the dry run area. Um, she's kind of, um, so she's along, she's between 1st Street, 2nd Street, Southwest. Uh, about in the one, two, three, four, five, about the 500 block of 2nd Street Southwest on the west side. And so she backs up onto the dry run, but her property is not a part of the dry run. She's exclusively uh, a U1 designation, as is her neighbor to the south, but all the properties around them are, are our designation. So, and so. <coughs> it's not, no, it, it doesn't have any effect on their property except when they go to sell and they list the zoning for the property, because in communities, the zoning is your menu of options you can and can't do. So the U1 allows for residential usage, uh, essentially allows you to rebuild, um, and the setbacks are, are similar, but there are some nuances to residential setbacks in the U1. They're different. So I, in other words, I'm trying to conform those to what the neighboring surrounding property uses are. So that's why I feel it's warranted for those situations, uh, Dave. But to, like to address all the other ones, I guess I, I mean, I'd be happy to kind of walk you through them. But my thought is, if it's a city-owned property and it's partially an R and in U1, I have no problem just saying, well, that's all in U1 because we don't have any intentions of building anything along the rivers. But 
So, so in other words, this is our attempt to clean up the zoning maps rather than having a, frankly, kind of an, uh, an arbitrary line that in some cases doesn't even follow the floodway line. It just kind of goes straight. It, it, it seems to me, and I'm just going to kind of jump in, but I think I understand what you're trying to do, but I, I personally see value in the current system. However, I feel like we've got the cart before the horse and that we should read have it redrawn to what the new flood maps are. And it should that should be the the delineating factor. You know, the if uh, whatever lot I'm looking at should be more or less, you that's great. But I don't think it should be all R. I, I really see value for the purchaser uh, to know that there's two different things going on here and I'm still somewhat concerned that a lot of attorneys might well miss it and it's real nice to have the uh, title opinion written so somebody's got some protections out there but it seems to me that rather than make them all R1 the U1 still makes sense but the U1 should factually run with um, the flood maps so people really know what is useful and what isn't usable and what isn't or buildable and isn't. It, it sounds like we're going in a circle. We've got minutes that we got on hold so that we can get those straightened out. And we've got some of these other questions that are coming up. What I'd recommend we do is to uh, put this back on our agenda for next month. We take care of the minutes, come to closure on that, and perhaps then that will give us the direction we need in order to to resolve this issue. That makes sense? Makes sense to me. I'll follow that unless I hear otherwise, but I, I like that. Is this something that's done in a lot of cities where we have a river here's, in play? Or? Here's what you see in a lot of cities. A lot of cities either they just show a straight zoning. They don't even put this environmentally sensitive or don't even, even if you have floodplain, they don't even put it on their zoning map. But in Waverly, uh, it was thought of that that would be an important feature to include so people understand the environmental hazards. Now, the other way to do this is to go about it the way I'm proposing and then on to do an overlay district, they call it, and to more accurately mirror those actual FEMA maps and put like a crosshatch area. You see those in communities. I know Cedar Falls has that. Maybe Iowa City, Ames. There are communities in Iowa that do that. So in other words, you create a different district so you're restricted within those confines of those district overlay districts, okay? So my, my thought was keep the U1 for the properties that don't have a residence uh, on them that are close to the river, but if they have a residence on them and it's half U1 and half R1, just make it all R1. But I can understand your merits of doing that, but I, I, I kind of respectfully disagree because I think you can still accomplish that through a FEMA map separate from the zoning district map. So, but but I will revisit the minutes, like uh, I think Hank had suggested, and and put this back for the next month, just to kind of say, here's what staff's going to do, thoughts, comments, and then we'll kind of move forward from there. The other thing we talked about with the minutes, Dave, you were going to go and spend a little bit of time to check those out. I'm not interested in having the two of you come to agreement on anything, but. I'd really, I'd really like to make sure that the points that are to be made can be made with clarity of, of understandings. So let's, let's go ahead and do that. Okay, corridor planning. Um, it was last discussed in April of 2013. Uh, it's been kind of back and forth. Uh, we brought it back in January of uh, this year, and uh, we're talking about it again tonight. I, I think uh, we've experienced some real success in forming a task group uh, within the commission. Uh, Rich and uh, Susan have, have, I think, made that obvious uh, in the work they did with uh, Ben in preparing for tonight's discussion on the, on the uh, screenings. Uh, I'm going to suggest we do the same thing with corridor planning, and in that regard, I've asked Kate if she would head... Uh, be the team leader for a group of us, maybe one other person, maybe two, uh, that uh, she could meet with and with Ben 
to begin to uh, take a look at what are the elements that we ought to be looking at so that we can have an, an in-depth discussion uh, led by some folks that have got a deeper uh, sense of it than, than we might have. So with that, Kate, uh, you've got comments you might like to make? Uh, um, no, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll come up with something. I, I, mean, I mean, I do honestly think the quarter planning is a, is, a, is a good thing to do, and I think that it's an appropriate thing to do, and I think it kind of refers back to what you were talking about with the new, there's the new buildings going up on fourth, South 4th Street. And, and then I know that there's going to be some issues potentially on 4th Street as it gets toward Bremer Avenue, which is a whole different feel. Uh, full disclosure, I think I sent a letter as a Preservation Commission member a while back regarding that particular stretch. You, you might need to know <laughs> that. Um, You're not going to recuse yourself now, are you? <laughs> you may want to recuse, recuse me. I don't think so. <laughs> Uh, how about if people Is who I, have an interest would let you know? That would be great. And then you form the team and uh, get together with Ben and uh, let's get this thing let's get this thing moving. So who who would like to volunteer? Why don't you just write it and present it? <laughs> <laughs> I think you just don't want me doing it by myself. <laughs> no, I, I I mean I think it's. Important, um, I think, of going into Cedar Falls, and you got the salvage yard on the east side of it. I think it, it is important. I was just coming back from Decor this afternoon, but outside of Cresco, and there's a kind of a small salvage yard, you know, as you're coming in Cresco. So I think it is, it is important. Uh, I saw a hand go up over there, Bill. Yeah, I can have it, Bill. Okay. And if anyone else has an interest, just let Kate know, and uh, we'll go out. You, you guys have got us started on a new, a new way to work. And, uh, thank you. You did it. <laughs> well, you, you made it happen. I enjoyed our, our morning meeting. <laughs> Any new business? Dave, how about an update on the score? <laughs> up by 21. Okay. Who's up by 21? Iowa State over Arkansas. Is that important? No. <laughs> <laughs> It'll never find its way into the minutes. <laughs> okay, do I hear a motion to adjourn? I do, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Susan.